on, happy Sunday. Let's make some noise out here. The Freedom Forum has arrived. The Wine Dance Plaza. Oh boy, this is a really a great afternoon, a great venture, great talent, great organizations. Everything is just the bomb.com. <laughs> I know we're gonna do thanks at the end, but I really want to thank Erica Duncan. And Erica Duncan is, give a wave, Erica. Give Erica, come on, give a round of applause. Her story is her vision where she created a platform where writers can become a catalyst for change and ch creating policy and thought-provoking action. And through Kerry, who is a, um, one of the community advocates here at Wine Dance Plaza, she introduced me to Erica. Erica and I connected, and the rest is her story. Yeah. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> OK, so I just want to give us this little tidbit when she first mentioned to me about environmental justice, I never thought about environmental justice. I'm just going to be honest. I always thought of environmental justice like save the whales and recycling and don't litter. That really was where my mind was at. Not saying that I didn't think that was important, but it wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't woke, <laughs> right? Using a, a current terminology. I didn't know that environmental justice is everything that affects each and every one of us, things that are dear to our heart. I didn't know it was civil rights. I didn't know it was waste management in minority background, mm. backyards. I didn't know any of that. So from meeting Erica, from being asked to be a part, to be a consultant in this endeavor, my eyes have been enlightened. And so I'm just grateful for it and we have some really great writers, writers from the community that are going to be sharing their stories with you. And then we have also our Greek chorus over here. And there are punctuation marks, that's what we call them. They're the question mark, they're the exclamation point, they're the period. They add the, the sofrito, the adobo, the, uh, the sasong, the garlic, you know, the, the lowries, the spice, you know. So sit back, relax afterwards. We're going to have a Q&A and thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the Freedom Forum. The earth is moaning, moaning, writing, waiting. The earth is moaning, groaning, waiting, waiting for the answer, waiting for the answer. Waiting for the answer, waiting for the answer. I used to love to see the mountain. I remember asking my mother to drive past there on clear nights. I have a distinct image in my mind of its beauty. Large and unreachable, it glistened under the moon with a backdrop of stars. Another wonder that I could not explore in my tiny world. I would feel the anticipation rise as we turned the corner and arrived on straight path. We weren't bubbling up so eagerly as I can see the mountain's top from up the street. We weren't there yet, but my heart was. I had no understanding of the other neighborhoods and worlds that existed beyond this short section of the street that held the mountain and town that I grew up in. I used to think we were so special for being such a small town with a whole mountain. Other places around here weren't like that. I remember it used to have a big star lit up towards the left of it, confirming my assumptions of a wonderful gift from the sky. I wanted to reach out and touch the sides, maybe get so close that I could climb up and sit at the top next to the stars. I used to get frustrated, wondering why the road was so far, why there was unmanaged landscape in front, why was it fenced in from the rest of us? I didn't know any of these answers. I don't remember how much I cared. I could have figured this mountain was so important that it had to be kept away from the rest of us. Then there was also a smell that would linger as we drove by. This couldn't be coming from my mountain. It was the kind of smell that you remember. It creeps up both nostrils quickly in an effort to scare your senses. I was shaken but not stirred as I allowed my eyes to trace the outline of the mountain and take in its greenery. 
When I would drive past with my mother, I would hold my breath to make sure my vision wasn't interrupted. One day, we drove past the mountain during the day. This time, I noticed something different. There was a big yellow truck driving across the front as if the mountain was nothing more than a construction site. My eyes widened as I rushed to steal my mother's glance from the road. Look, there's a truck in front of the mountain. But it was too late. My mother didn't share my enthusiasm for the mountain or belief that it was some kind of sacred place that shouldn't be trampled on. I don't even think it's a mountain, she said, until, without looking as my mind wandered onto all the possibilities of what this place could be. This wasn't a mountain, it was an imposter. And if it wasn't my mountain, what could it possibly be? My mother didn't know and made little efforts to act like she cared as we continued on our travels. But I needed to know. If that truck could go up there, why couldn't I? I could at least get close. I didn't know who to turn to for answers and I questioned people in the neighborhood. What mountain? It was as if I was the only one who saw it or the only one who referred to it as a mountain. Then one person made it clear and created a dent in my fantasy. You mean that dump? Dump like trash? Dump like garbage? Like where the garbage trucks go? The meaning of this word and its connection to my mountain were not connecting, especially since I had never seen a real dump before, or so I had thought. When I pictured the word dump, I imagined miles of garbage, fragments even. I imagine a horrible smell and land that has no person living around for miles. And don't ask me how they get rid of all that trash. My mind didn't even go that far. It was a challenge for me to begin to believe that this grand natural wonder this mountain in the suburbs that I wanted to climb had turned into a rank pile of dirt overnight. I had not seen the imposter since I found out who it was, and the memories I had had all escaped me or been distorted. Dumps had a smell. That smell was coming from that mound. Maybe the green I saw wasn't there. Maybe the star wasn't there, but I know it was. I remember how the scene looked, and I wanted to be up there. P-I-M-B-Y, put it in a minority backyard. Pimby. 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 Put it in a minority. Put it back there. Put it in a minority. Put it back there. Put it in a minority backyard. 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 Put it in a minority. Put flowers around it. Put it back there. Make it real nice. Put it in a minority. Play loud music. Put it back there. Make it real bright. Put it in a minority backyard. 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 Put it in a minority. I told you already. I don't want to have kids. I hear you. But why? I mean, you don't have to if you don't want to. But why? I don't know. You tell me why. Tell me, why should I bring kids to a planet where they most likely are going to suffer? Have you seen the news lately? Do you hear about the Amazon fires? The global warming? The icebergs are melting. The planet is melting. We are melting with it. No. I won't have children coming to this doomed planet. I hear you, but do you really think we are doomed? His eyes moved from my face to his tight fists that were resting on his skinny legs. It's all of your fault, you know, he say. It's all of the adult's fault. You never thought what future your children will have. You did not worry as we do now. It's the adult's fault. You're not even trying to fix it. You use Wangos to take the responsibility of creating who knows what? A miracle? that saves the planet that you destroy little by little every single day? A tear ran down inside my heart and I decided to stop asking. How could I deny his truth? 
It is the truth. We are leaving nothing to the end, not even hope. Use problems to be dealt with it. Or at least, that is what I believe listening to this 15-year-old boy and his reasons to not ever have children. Glistening blue washed over the small beige dirt. With each splash and smack of the waters, my eagerness grew. Of all the beautiful things I've seen in my life, this was one of the best. Fish swam through the clear water, nibbling at people's feet. Children squealed with joy, calling out to their parents, come on, join me. Seagulls cried in unison, seeking for the next scavenge they could obtain from the hungry people. The grainy sand was hot, almost blazing. Yet it didn't seem to bother anyone, only encouraging more visitors and natives to dive into the rich ocean. Every warm step only led closer to the cool and colorful water on this beach, lined with stands of delicious, savory food and chairs bending around the shapes of large adults. With the sun glistening and blinding, it seemed so perfect. The Dominican Republic was perfect, down by the sea. Yet how? How is it that within the blink of an eye, within the fragment of a second, that crystal clear blue water turned gray with sorrow? The seagulls here never cried. The children never called. The crashing of the waves crackled against the boulders and rocks. Sand, now replaced by broken glass and shredded red plastic cups, poked at my feet, every step stinging my path. No people, no fish just the grayish brown water pulling the trash into itself with weak and thick splatters. No colorful stands or folding chairs, just a sad, depressing sky reflecting the mournful, frothy, disgusting water. Nothing and no one floated on the beaches of Long Island, my new home. Nothing but the bottles of water and empty promises for the future. Nothing but the upside down fish and choking turtles. Nothing but oil spills and dying animals. This unfamiliar place was far from perfect. New York was far from perfect, down by the sea. The trees passed by in blurs. We were moving too fast for me to focus on only one, but I didn't mind. It had practically become a sauna in the car, but we didn't feel like turning on the AC. Instead, we ended up opening the windows. Sorry. As soon as the first inch of the window was down, I could feel my hair being pulled back by that invisible, familiar, and gentle wind. I smiled and took a deep breath, noticing that the air was just so fresh. The trip upstate was a long one, but peaceful nonetheless. The GPS... The GPS has had been speaking throughout the whole ride and could and I couldn't help but look at uh, and I couldn't help but look at it every time it did just to check how long we had left to reach my cousin I couldn't wait I had always loved going there especially because of the space there was every home seemed to have its valleys of healthy green tones it all just felt so much brighter as I watched us drive closer and closer through the roads I noticed how much green there was every mile or Every mile or so had some form of a green big of a big green lot. Even the small houses had more green than I was used to. On Long Island, it was mostly gray. It stood out to me more, the visual difference. During our stay, I was surrounded by greenery. Green fields with lavenders, green fields with dogs chasing each other, or even me. I would look fondly at my sandals stained with green and wish there were more hours in the day to enjoy it all, to soak it all in. I would sometimes catch myself standing at my cousin's patio, admiring the small valley. I would also at times wonder, why can't it be like this everywhere? As fast as it came, one week had passed and I had to go back to that little island I called home. After staying in a place long enough, people tend to forget what it's like to return to your origin, including myself. The one week became blurry images of smiles, slobbery dogs, and just green. We were driving through the highway as I watched it, that transition from nature and bricks to bricks, a transition that said this is reality. I watched as large trees turned into large stone walls lined with trash. I knew those walls were for our safety, but the waste lining them wasn't. 
It hit me with the, with the weight of those same walls. There's less of it. There's less of that familiar peace, and there's less of that green. I needed to know one more thing, one more thing I needed to breathe in to solidify it all. I stretched my arm towards the armrest where the window switch was. I pressed down on it, and as soon as I did, I knew the change in the air. It smelled strange, worse even, but the main difference was the heaviness of it. As I breathed in, my, lung, my lungs took in less air. It felt nothing like the Arab state. Was this really all we had to show for the progress we've made on this earth? Murky air? Air so dirty our airways narrowed? It angered me, putting a pit in my chest that would weigh down, down on me and refuse to leave. When the opportunity for community service came around, I was ready. My sister, a member, the director of the club, and I joined at the beginning of a small forest. We noticed that, the sm that a small chunk of it had already been cleaned, but it still looked like a mess. There was still a lot of work to do. We worked together, black trash, black trash bags in gl blue gloved hands, and got to it. We went along the trying to get as deep into the small forest as possible, clearing everything our young eyes could see. The more garbage we picked up, though, the more we seemed to spot. It seemed as if no th no, it seemed as if, uh, it seemed as if no matter, it seemed as if no matter how many bags were filled, no matter how many gloves were broken, and no matter how many thorns poked and pinched at our skin, there were more. There was more buried in the ground. Our efforts could barely be seen. We ended the service hours later, and we left for home. I kept looking back at it. Why? Why can people see that this is why we breathe that heavy air and that this is why so many of us are getting sick? I knew the answer, though. I knew they saw it all. Why didn't they do something before we got here? They must, they must have seen the signs, right? Or maybe they were too caught up in their own bubbles and their own worlds to realize that the world we all share is slowly rotting right in front of us. So why do we choose to stay at a standstill? Coffee. I need a cup of coffee. Hmm. Well, I need coffee because I'm from El Salvador. Salvadorians, we drink coffee. We are supposed to drink coffee. So I drink and I drink. <laughs> Once our economy was rooted in cafetales, that's coffee farms. Big companies like a slow cloud that became a never ending storm got to Central and South America and took the land from the indigenous people's hands because they, like me, also love coffee. They bought and they killed for the land. They planted and collected money so they could sell our coffee as a delicatess to other countries. You have to admit it, it is a great business model. Spend a little money, gain a lot. I need more coffee, it is cool. Huh. The water is hot and the cup is turning black with, li with liquid ink. I ask myself, nowadays, whose land is being taken away because I like coffee the way I do? Am I supposed to drink expensive coffee because they, the companies like the one with the two-tailed mermaid, supposedly pay more to the farmers and treat them in a more humane way? Should I celebrate them for discovering that the farmers are humans too? Ouch, I burn myself. Now that I think about it, coffee should be red used to match the blood spilled over all the centuries for it, for it to get to my cup. In El Salvador, we didn't drink our coffee. It was too expensive. We drank an imitation, an imitation called Café Listo, which is instant coffee. 
so that my people can keep working in the farms for little to nothing to get other people like me the real deal, the real coffee. Hmm. I always have coffee when I want it. Maybe that is one of the reasons the youth don't believe in us anymore, the coffeeholic adults. We think of what we want, what we need, and of what we think we need. But the children, they don't need coffee. They need tomatoes and milk. Oh my God, the milk, the cows. Poor cows. <laughs> what am I thinking? That's another matter for another day. This coffee break is over, and this cup is getting cold. The earth is moaning, groaning, waiting. The earth is moaning, groaning, waiting, waiting for the answer, waiting for the Waiting for the answer. Waiting for the answer. I remember working in the hospital, and one day in the emergency room, there's a loud commotion. A young black man is yelling in pain, pleading for pain medication. Although everyone can hear him, and the staff seems to be ignoring his pleas. He's doubled over in a chair. He doesn't seem to be making any quick movements, but security is ominously close and on standby. I could see the clinical staff huddled and conferring, although no one approached or addressed the young man during the time I was present. Later I learned that the young man was a sickle cell patient. He's been to the hospital numerous times, and the staff has labeled him as a frequent flyer seeking drugs. He has a history of presenting to local ERs in search of pain medication when having a sickle cell crisis. Although he clearly has a documented chronic condition, staff sees him as an addict seeking drugs. I thought of all the patients in the same hospital, not two quiet floors up, receiving medications at the press of a button to manage their cancer or post-operative pain. No one was questioning their pain or categorizing them as drug-seeking. The difference being that sickle cell disease primarily affects us, the black community, and is accompanied by the same racism and stereotypes that black people face in this country. Some healthcare workers who are supposed to be professional views this disease with negative stigmas because of our race. I wondered how these educated people would have limited stereotype views that interfere with their professionalism. And then I realized, I've seen this before. Different time, different location, same racist assumptions. I remember back in February 1974, Black History Week is being celebrated nationally. We hadn't arrived at Black History Month yet. Half Hollow Hills High School is a school which at the time had approximately 2,400 students enrolled. Less than 50 of those students were black. We, the Black Student Union, BSU, of Half Hollow Hills decided to host a celebratory Black History event. We decided we would dress in ethnic attire and proudly sport our afros, braids, and natural hairdos. We were able to secure a small, unused room for the day. We bought cultural items to display and ethnic food that could be sampled. We kept a rotation of BSU members in the room to answer any questions. We invited students, teachers, and the parents of BSU students 
to come and observe our celebration. My grandmother, Isabel Kennedy, was excited to support our celebration. She was an entrepreneur and business co-owner with my grandfather of Kennedy's Imports and Exports. The store was located right around the corner here on Merritt Avenue in Wyandanch and was chock full of artifacts and handmade goods from all over the world. She loaned us several items to put on display. We had African masks, art, imported leather goods, spears and drums made from animal skins and leather were among the items that we put out for display. My grandmother accepted our invitation to come and observe. When she arrived at the school in her matching dashiki and turban with her African jewelry, she stopped a faculty member in the hall intending to inquire where the celebration was taking place. Before she could say anything, the faculty member stated, oh, you must be looking for the kitchen, insinuating that she must surely be a cook or a kitchen aide. Never mind that there were no black people working in the kitchen at all. My grandmother quickly drew herself to her full five foot one height and asked to be escorted to the principal's office. Once she gained an audience with the principal, she explained to him who she was and why she was there. She also explained in no uncertain terms that staff training was in order so that staff can be taught to not make assumptions of such a stereotypical nature. She recognized the so-called professionals teaching children held the same racist stereotypes because they had no training or exposure to our culture, nor were they required to educate themselves. These and other events shaped my childhood. I currently work in healthcare, and like my grandmother, I've learned to shine a light on prejudices and advocate for continued training for those who are charged with improving our health but have no exposure or investment in our community, environment, or culture. Healthcare is a system, like many others, that has not traditionally treated people of color fairly or ethically. We know the famous stories like the Tuskegee experiment and Henrietta Lacks. We've also seen recent shifts in the drug trend move from criminal, when in the black community, to an addiction with treatment options as opposed to jail time when the opioid crisis expanded outside our neighborhoods. It was and is the same addiction. The response was different because of who we are and where we live. I've taught courses on cultural competency to healthcare workers. I realize that until we address the fundamental issues causing disparities, such as lack of education, negative stigmas, and preconceived notions, and provide training to those in the healthcare field, we will not receive equitable treatment or see a positive change. Black boy, black male, black high, black jail, no chance, no speech, no rep, no reach. White boy, white high, white court, white side, give chance, give speech, give rep, must reach. Same drug choice, but different hands. Same law broken, but different paths. Give him five on the black hand side. Take his life on the black hand side. Same drug choice, but different hands. Same law broken, but different paths. Give him five on the black hand side. Take his life on the black hand side. Good afternoon, Crime Danch. I despise that word. Don't you ever call my community Wine Danch, Crime Danch. Yeah, I know Wine Danch. Do you know Wine Danch? Do you know Wine Danch? Do you remember Delano Stewart's insurance company? Otto's Deli? Chance Liquor Store? The Wine Danch Pharmacy? Larry's Discount? Red's Beauty Supply Store? g and Beauty Supply and One Stop Records, my parents owned that business. We had a McDonald's, a Kentucky Fried Chicken and Wine Danch. We have a Chase Full Service Branch that is now a laundromat in Wine Danch. These are some of the only businesses that provided jobs and hope 
for the wine dance community. We had a dream that other major companies would come to wine dance, but that never happened. It never happened. Did you know that many people that were famous graced the streets of wine dance, like Rakim and Eric B. Yes, Rakim and Eric B. Not Eric B and Rakim. Rakim! Daryl Chill B. Groove, De La Soul, EPMD, Ken Spiderweb from 98.7 KISS FM, Soul For Real, and the list goes on. I had a dream. Wine Dance will rise. Wine Dance will rise. Potholes, flooded streets, trash because there were no trash cans. I have a dream. The change is coming. The change is coming. When you enter the Wine Dash Plaza, the newly constructed Long Island Railroad, north of the tracks on Straight Path, AKA Martin Luther King Boulevard, I have a dream. You will find shopping over here, 7-Eleven, restaurants, chiropractors, a T-Mobile, two banks, a grooming service, beautiful landscape gardens, and well-manicured lawns. Relaxing park area where you can relax, where the residents and the community can relax and chill out. Well-lit parking lots, sidewalks clean daily, ice skating during the winter, concerts, farmer's markets, yoga, Zumba, and a reading rainbow during the summer. Let's talk about my business, Sir Shade, behind us over here. Sir Shade was conceived by myself, a professional man in the world of finance. I grew tired of going into New York City to barbershops in order to get a quality service. I wanted services like shaves, shoe shines, services other shops just didn't offer in our community. I wanted a place where the customer was the most important person in the room and service was provided with the right attitude. I wanted a place to relax where people could find flat screen TVs, some relaxing jazz music, a comfortable environment like some living room furniture. I found it didn't exist, therefore I created Sir Shave. It's a one of a kind experience. Sometimes a guy doesn't want to just go to the same old barbershop. Sometimes he wants a cool beverage, a haircut, and yeah, maybe a massage and a straight razor shave. Enter the Sir Shave Barber Parlor, a new anti-spa made for the man or woman. Basically, that means a well-stocked refrigerator, overstuffed black leather chairs, again, a 4K screen TV. Sometimes tune to ESPN or CNBC, you might see that on, the, on actual TV screens. You know, straightforward services for the simple beard trim or facial. We didn't get very retro. You know, we didn't get too kitschy with the decor. Think Harlem Lounge, not a Harvard club. But the harsh reality is that all is not the same for the residents of 11798. When you leave the Wine Dance Plaza and you head south of the tracks, you begin to see the disparities of a community that's been under siege for more than 50 years. As you drive down Straight Path, I have a dream, you begin to see the differences of the unfair injustices of a community that is still forgotten from the non-existence of sewer systems, unpaved streets, smells, and poor quality of dwellings that are in complete disarray. It's heartbreaking to see this on a daily basis, but something has to change, and it's us demanding change. It's us demanding change. I have a dream. Prior to being introduced to Wine Dance back in 1986, my parents had a business over here in the same footprint. We lived in Dix Hills, and we rarely crossed the tracks since we were north of the tracks. One day, as we drove down Straight Path, I have a dream, MLK Boulevard, we stopped off at McDonald's and KFC to pick up a burger 
and a bucket of chicken in order to support the community and keep, keep jobs close to home. But something happened and they all went out of business. And we were told that they were closed due to internal employee theft. The five finger hookup they called it back in the day. What Wine Dance needed back in the day was a 10 finger hookup to the much needed sewers and sewer systems within our community, which never happened and caused many businesses to close and deter other businesses from ever coming to Wine Dance. And this is still the case south of the tracks. I'll never forget the day I was going to a presentation at the Wine Dance High School and the young man asked me, Mr. Banks, why would you put something like this in Wine Dance? I politely said to the young man, you don't think Wine Dance deserves something nice? All the classmates were speechless. And I immediately realized that they have been trained and conditioned to think this way about the community by the daily evidence of what's going on in their community. We had a dream. We had a dream. Where Sir She was currently located, my parents owned a business back in the day in the 1980s. And again, in the same exact footprint were potholes, cracked pavements were the norm, which would always cause flooding, flat tires, major undercarriage damage to most cars. They call it wine dance rising today, but it was more like wine dance burning back in the day. As a kid growing up in Westbury in the 1970s and the 1980s, I was always called El Negro because I was the only black kid on the bus based on where we lived back in the day in Westbury. Every time I got comfortable on the school bus, I would always hear, go to the back of the bus, El Negro, and it would burn my inner souls and I was outnumbered because I could not do anything. As I traveled through the parts of Westbury, I stumbled upon a neighborhood called Newcastle. You may know Newcastle, that's a part of Westbury. Lots of color, lots of possibilities, rich culture, but no jobs for the community back then. And I still today, due to the very same conditions in Wine Dance, those conditions still exist where there's no jobs in the actual Westbury Newcastle community. Those same streets are filled with the potholes. Again, another community that struggled to provide jobs for the residents. We've been hoodwinked, bamboozled, run amok, led astray. I still have a dream that wine dance will rise. Do you have that same dream? Do you still have that same dream? Change will come. Change will come. Change is coming. Black boy, black male, black high, black jail, no chance, no speech, no rep, no reach. White boy, white high, white court, white side, give chance, give speech, give rep, must reach. Same drug choice but different hands, same law broken but different paths, give him five. On the black hand side, take his life. On the black hand side, same drug choice but different hands, same law broken but different paths, give him five. On the black hand side, take his life. On the black hand side, I would like to introduce Jenny Guerrero with her story. It's going to be in Spanish, but uh, our hel helpers are uh, distributing it in English, so you'll be able to follow with Jenny. And her story is called, I C Don't Forget to Breathe Again, No Olvides Respirar Otra Vez. Aquí está Jenny. Papi, ¿recuerdas ese día que llegué a este país? Ese viaje 
lleno de dolor y lo que sucedió después, esa decepción que sentí al ver que tenías otra familia, la que estaba a tu lado no era mi madre ni mis hermanos, a los 22 años vine a conocerte de verdad y no tuve la suficiente madurez para entender que tenías una nueva esposa y un nuevo hijo y yo solo supe huir. En realidad, siempre quise que me detuvieras para compensar los momentos de mi infancia en el que no estabas a mi lado, para calmar el cansancio que sentía por el doloroso no por el doloroso viaje que viví, no por el camino espinoso en el que anduve, sino por dejar a mi madre y a mis hermanos y por el precio que tuve que pagar para llegar a un país que no era el mío. Pero no me detuviste y me dejaste ir. Hoy vengo a verte. Te veo acostado allí. Una enfermedad te aleja de mí y al mismo tiempo me muestra dónde permanece mi orgullo y mis resentimientos, porque siempre quise que volvieras. Cuando te veo, me convierto en una niña que ama a su padre. Me gustaría que mi amor fuera el bálsamo para aliviar tu dolor, pero el tiempo se acaba y mis sentimientos me traicionaron mis emociones, mis deseos de tener esa familia nuevamente. Te veo cansado y mis deseos de que te quedes son más fuertes que mi resentimiento, pero una enfermedad segura me muestra la fragilidad del ser humano que está a mi lado. Como cuando me fui, no hay orgullo en mi corazón, me duele verte así, te veo y no te veo. No hay arrogancia, solo un ser humano sufriendo. Te veo y aunque ya es tarde, acepto tu decisión. Dentro de mí un grito, no me dejes otra vez. Tu cuerpo no es el mismo, tu voz tiembla en tus labios blancos que por unas pocas veces se abrieron para pronunciar palabras delirantes. Veo que tu dama... Ya no es la mujer que peleó para que yo me alejara de ti. Veo en sus ojos dolor, angustia, cansancio. Y me pregunto, ¿a dónde fuimos para no valorar la vida, la lealtad, la comprensión y el amor? Un virus nos enseñó que un día más de vida es una lección, una oportunidad para que liberes esa espina que te detiene y que te des cuenta de quién realmente eres, como hombre, como mujer, como hijo o como hija, como esposo o como esposa, como padre o madre, como amigo. Muchos se fueron sin disfrutar, sin perdonar. Solo la esperanza que nos da nuestro Creador permanece en su misericordia. Esa luz que vemos al final del túnel que odia la amargura y la convierte en amor, un consuelo al abrazar a tus seres queridos o simplemente a ese ser extraño que la vida te pone en el camino y que hoy es todo lo que tienes. Respirar juntos, abrazarnos de nuevo y llenarnos de amor, ahogar el rencor y sobre todo el miedo, acoger el amor, la risa. Papi, Sé feliz y no olvides respirar una vez más. No puedo respirar, no puedo respirar, no puedo respirar, no puedo respirar. No puedo respirar. Tus motivos me ahogan, 
tus pensamientos me matan, no puedo respirar, no puedo respirar. I can't breathe, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Your motives are choking me. Your thoughts are killing me. I can't breathe. Your motives are choking me. Your thoughts are killing me. I can't breathe. Unfamiliar numbers of unfamiliar faces. A couple of weeks ago, I took my daughter down to the post office. She needed stamps. Anyway, I sat there in the parking lot and waited for her. I looked across the street at the clinic and I couldn't help but wonder how many people have walked in there with COVID? How many families and students of mine have lost loved ones? Then I couldn't help but think about how it reminded me of the HIV breakout. And now it's being said, that the COVID virus is so big in the black community and how they said the same thing about the HIV virus, it being so big in the black community. I, for one, I don't like how every time that there's a disease, an epidemic, that's worldwide suddenly is so big in the black community, so focused on the black community. I feel this way because I remember a time when I was just coming of age and started dating and looking forward to really, really dating. Then suddenly HIV comes out. I had a childhood friend who died of AIDS. I miss her a lot. Anyway, I read an article and suddenly it went from being a big worldwide disease to now saying it's real, real heavy. It's a heavy disease in a black community. At this point, I'm like, give me a break. You've got to be kidding me. But there was a side of me that was curious. So I parked my car behind Larry's discount. You guys remember Larry's? Anyway, I sat there and I grabbed a milk carry. And I sat there and I watched to see if there was anybody I knew. Who were these young brothers and sisters they were talking about? Some of you guys may remember when Wine Dance was predominantly African-American, right? Well, anyway, I sat there and I watched. Surely I would recognize somebody, anybody. Well, I saw people. I saw plenty of people. But no one that looked like me. Nobody that mirrored me. I saw people. But I saw white people. I saw young and old, but mostly young. I watched white people get off the train. They would go into the clinic, then leave the clinic and get back on the train. I watched this all day, over and over again. And then it clicked. They were leaving their neighborhoods, coming into our neighborhoods and getting tested. They were actually getting tested where we live. They were dropping off their stats, dropping off their disease. It was true that the numbers were going up, but they were going up in the clinic, not the community. There's a difference. Same old trick, just a new disease, a new illness. It makes me wonder, can the numbers be trusted? Are the numbers being manufactured? Not by any means am I saying that these sicknesses aren't real. I'm not saying that. But why us? Why always in our community? 
unfamiliar numbers with unfamiliar faces. I can't breathe. 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 Your motives are choking me. Your thoughts are killing me. I can't breathe. Your motives are choking me. Your thoughts are killing me. I can't breathe. Where is that terrible odor coming from? I was driving down this pothole-ridden street. It's not that bad now. Oh, you should have been here a few summers ago, responded one of the residents. It was so strong, you could hardly even go outside. Well, what are you going to do about it? Can't you see? This is where those issues of cancer stem from. No one is watching. And this goes on for years. And people just die off. And no one knows what made them sick and die so soon. We must do something about this. There is so much here. Hardworking people like yourself. See, everybody comes and goes here and there, in and out. Some like yourself taking care of others at your home. You're here all day long. We have to do something about this. I'm driving down the street. Look, the children are playing, some on their skateboards, others on their bicycles. Some are running as fast as they can to catch up the others on their wheel toys. So what is going to happen to these children who live there all their lives? And then only to hear, mom says, my little boy has cancer of the brain. But Jessica, she's only 10. And now she's on hormone shots. And my husband, we've been living here for 22 years. And now he has to start chemotherapy. I'm asking myself, how is it that all these families are getting sick and they live in this community? To tell you the truth, the odor is coming from that industrial garage next door where the trucks park. They empty their refuse, they come, and they go every day and bring it back. I don't know what those chemicals are they're using, but it has to be bad. Is anybody saying anything about this? Nor has anybody addressed this with the town of Babylon? Look where we are. They would not think any value to do anything about it. So they just keep doing their business and enriching their lives. Would they want that odor in their backyard? Would they want to welcome a family over for a backyard barbecue with that smell? It is strange that nobody thinks of this. The owners, the workers, and worst of all, the homeowners that live right here. Well, can I start over? Yeah. So I'm driving down this street. It's all over the place. You have a pothole there and an elevation a few feet ahead, then a driveway that slopes down into a valley-like surface. The street has a color variations of grays and blacks and ashy gray and whitish patches and dirt as a fill-in. This long overdue road has made its mark. It has done its civic duty for this town. It has offered all it could. And this is a result 
It's telling you, I cannot do any more for you. The sides of the street slide down to meet the driveways, and they are both unsure how to connect with each other. I hear the residents from the block say that winter after winter, the street repairs come. They put a pothole fill in here, and that's it. On the other hand, I can appreciate three minutes away from here. The utility trucks from the town are preparing a row of street for a total street replacement. Yep. No less than a week later, the road is smooth, one black, even color, with a yellow line down the middle of the street. Yes, I would like to find out how did they get that done and how pleasant it must be when the cars pull in their driveways without any impediments. How long was their street in disrepair? Or really, was it? Did they just need a facelift? As I recall, that was not much of a surface issue, as I often drove down that street almost every day. You see, they are on the other side of town. Remember? I said it was only three minutes away. Yet I re see repairs happening all over the place. And then the other roadway that I must tell you I enjoy driving down is on my way to work. The pleasant tree-lined streets that takes me there. The recently paved roadways, and yes, the people who live there, they don't look like me. Yet they have a smooth surface to take them home. I'd love to live on that street, wouldn't you? Put it in a minority. Put, Put it, it back, back there. there. Put, Put it in a minority. Put flowers around it. Put, Put it back there. there. Play loud music. Put, Put it in a minority backyard. 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 Put it in a minority. Put it back there. Put it in a minority. Make it real nice. Put it back there. Make it real bright. Put it in a minority backyard. 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 Put it in a minority. Put it in a minority. Wow. How did you like that? Come on, let's give them a round of applause. Wow, wow, wow. We, let's introduce the writers. I'll start over here. We have Belinda Castiblanco. We have Jenny Aguilar. Javelis, <laughs> Javelis Beto. Javelis and Muriel are juniors in high school. Awesome, right? Talented. Hiding back here, we have Karen Lumpkin. Right behind me, we have Dawn Littles. We have Muriel. Muriel Vito, they're twins, forgive me. We have Desiree Woodhall. Mr. Sir Shave, Keith Banks. And last but not least, Heather Pasmore. And now can you give it up for my Greek chorus? Is this Greek chorus awesome or what? When Erica told me about this, my head went, oh man, I, I want a Greek chorus, I want a Greek chorus. And then while I was washing the dishes, I was like, put it in one already, put it back there, pimby, 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 pimby. Like, the songs just started coming and coming when I started hearing the writers. So I would really like to thank Selena Quinones, her husband, Antonio Quinones, and Kamora Taylor. I feel really old. Kamora way back used to be one of my drama students. Now she's a grown married woman. 
That's scary. <laughs> We'd like to thank Waldo, who is videotaping for us, creating a film that we're going to be able to distribute. We want to thank Smiley. We always have to give the sound man love. There is no sound man, no show. <laughs> so thank you. As Erica and the Her Story staff start to come up, I'd like to thank Helen, Milady, Amber, Belinda, Dawn, and Hermancina. Please come on up. We also want to thank Liz and the BACA team. And we have some BACA board members here. BACA, 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 BACA. I have to give a little shout out to BACA. I'm a member of BACA, the Babylon Arts Council. And we are so grateful for BACA wanting to partner with her story to bring this to the wine dance community. So thank you. Thank you so much. And we want to thank Suffolk County Office of Film and Cultural Affairs, Humanities New York, for their generous support. OK, um, Helen, would you like to share a little bit? Why don't you use? Well, I just want to give my deepest and serious thanks to all of you for braving this sort of cold day, autumn day. Les quiero dar las gracias a todos que han llegado aquí hoy a pasar el día con nosotros en este evento. And I, I would like to um, turn it over to our esteemed leader, Erica Duncan, to say a few words. Um, for us, this is really a big day. We haven't seen Erica since COVID. So this is so special to have her. And I think my colleagues agree that this is amazing. Well, I, I almost don't know what to say. Um, I think this has been a 25-year dream, really, that a community could find its voice in this way. And I'm just so, so moved by six weeks ago when I first started to talk to Renee about the idea for this. And we got together, and all of these marvelous readers you heard, and uh, via Zoom, we began to meet and began really began to talk about those moments where the soul cries out and the concept that just working with Renee, working with all of you, has been just totally amazing. And a minister in one of our early workshops in Farmingville around 2005 um, shortly after the violence of the immigrants there, um, said, um, you can argue with a political position, but you can't argue with the story. And it has been for all these years our mission to try to turn uh, people's passions, people's anger, people's experiences into those stories that nobody, nobody can turn away from. And I'm hoping that once this film is made, that we can go forth. So um, this is in a tradition of Freedom Forums, which started a couple of years ago as a statewide movement to examine the cracks in the Liberty Bell. Through, through literature, has given birth to books like Brave Journeys uh, by young immigrant writers who cross the border by themselves, where 8,000 copies are now in circulation all over the nation. And I can't wait to see what this Freedom Forum is going to give birth to. Um, so the, I'm turning the microphone back to Renee, but Think of what is our call to action? Where do we want this to go?
Thank you so much, Erica. At this time, we are going to open it up. We have questions, and I believe you have answers. What now? You have these soul-stirring stories, some that you'll remember, some have really made an imprint in your mind, and now what? Do we just want a story, or do we want to be catalyst of change? So I'll put it out there. Where would you like to see these stories go? What would you like to see happen? I'm gonna ask you, Keith? These stories touch my heart in so many different ways. You know, everyone has a story from a different perspective. And the way I look at it is that, you know, we can't keep this silent. We have got to be very consistent and very focused on, you know, the matters at hand. You know, change is coming, no question about that, but we have to change together and come together and have that voice. And that's going to the school districts, that's going to our county, it's going to our legislators, and just taking it as high as possible. And we can't stop here, because again, the children are watching everything that we're doing. The old saying is each one teach one. We have to be that beacon of light to show the kids that there's possibilities, coming together and having a voice together. That's the most important thing. So that's what I want to see come out of this here as time goes on. And again, Rome wasn't built in a day. I get that. But we have to start somewhere. And today is one of those days I think we're going to start to see some changes in our mindsets and also in our families as well. Thank you, Keith. We have educators here. We have Desiree, who also works in the school system. And then I have a long-standing friend back there, Renee Williamson, who's also a teacher. Both of them work in the Y Dance Schools. You're around our youth all the time. What do you think we should do? What do you see as the next step? Desiree? Good afternoon, and thanks again for coming out. Um, it's very simple for me. I think our youth need to know their power when it comes to government, when it comes to voting. There was a time when I was growing up that I was talking about where we were very strong in our youth when it came to voting and understanding how strong our vote is. And now it just seems that the generation coming up really believes the hype of your vote doesn't count. Your vote does count. And it is my dream to pull together to get as many voters or as many young people signed up to vote and start their own little coalition where they can understand that it begins local. Everybody thinks it's about the presidential vote, and that's great, but it means nothing if it doesn't start local, if they don't understand how important their voice is locally, and it starts right in their own community. So if you see me out there waving and begging, I pray that you're waving and begging with me. Thank you. Begging for votes. <laughs> votes. <laughs> Renee? Good afternoon, good afternoon. Um, having worked in the Winding School District for about 15 years now, I believe what needs to happen is because as I look around, I'm missing something, the youth. I'm missing those students that if I had known we could have come to the schools to say, I need you to come out because as I'm looking around, I don't see the community. So in order for us to make a change, we need to bring them out. And the young people, the ones that are going to, we're going to be able to bring them out. That when we're in the school in front of them to say, come on out. Because guess what? They're down there. They just didn't cross over over here. So, so that's what, to me, is missing. That the next time we hold something, let's go there and say, come here. Even on a Sunday, even on a Saturday. Because I, the stories that I heard today They've got a story too. And their story is gonna make a difference and that they're gonna bring our future where it needs to be. Thank you so much, Renee. And that is in alignment with what her story wants to do moving forward. And that's what we hope to do, especially with the film that Waldo is doing, to be able to reach the schools and reach the youth. So this is the beginning. And you're right on the pulse of where we wanna go. Um, I have another educator in the room a dear, dear friend, a young man that I've watched for a long time and he's a real role model and he's holding his head down because I'm putting him on the spot. And it's doctor, almost doctor, Jamel Hudson, professor. He's part of um, the Poor People's Campaign and if you can give him the mic, please. I know, yes, come, come, come forward some, please, Mr. Hud, professor Hudson. 
and share based on what you're listening. What do you think are the questions? What do you think are the answers? I know you have something to say. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jamel Clay Hudson. So blessed and honored to be here in this space. Um, I've heard a lot of great things, and I'll quickly just say this in my remarks. In 1968, Dr. King started the Poor People's Campaign, and then when he was assassinated, that movement continued under Ralph Abernathy. I'm actually going to take this off, only because I sat socially distanced, but I think I'm far enough away from everyone. Can you hear me? <laughs> Good. Alhamdulillah. Uh, I'm a part of a movement right now, the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, where we look at five interlocking injustices of racism, ecological devastation, militarism, poverty, and the false moral narrative uh, that takes certain ethical principles and distorts them. And I heard this, uh, many great speakers today speak about the ecological devastation in our communities, how places like Wyandanche and Westbury are are ignored and dumped and all the waste are put in and it's strategically done to make black and brown people sick. And it's gonna take a fusion, a fusion effort of black, of white, of poor, of educated, non-educated, all of us coming together and to have a shifting of the narrative by shifting the narrators. So while we heard these stories today, we're making a dedicated decision to use technology and our oratorical abilities to have the power to communicate our truth and to make a real shift through voting, through behaviors, through deeds, through this community coming together and saying there's life in Wine Dance. There's life over here, over the show. there's life in this community and we want to continue to make sure that the world, Long Island, sees the light that comes forth from this beautiful area. God bless you. See why I love that baby boy. <laughs> Health disparity, it's real, it's real. Um, even when I started looking up the 17 principles of environmental justice, that's where the phrase Pimpy came from, put in a minority backyard, and I started reading through it, I got so chucked up, choked up, that's where the I Can't Breathe song was birthed out of that. And it is real, and we feel it, and we continue to feel it, and we continue to see it, and can the numbers be trusted? I love that line. Heather, Heather is in the healthcare system. Speak to that for us. Thank you, I'm so glad that you all are here today. Um, I am a registered nurse, and my practice is in community health. And one of the pivotal things that we need to recognize is that when a client comes into the hospital or a community center, or a community center, or a community center, that we understand that they came from somewhere. They didn't just end up in the hospital. They're sick and then they go back nowhere. And so what has to happen is that us in the hospitals, in the community health, have to make an association that these lives are so valuable and the health of these individuals must be tended to, must be cared for. And when we see what's happening, as my sister spoke about, that mountain, that people who pass by going on their way to Dix Hills or wherever they live, that mountain is a problem. That garbage dump is a problem because lives are getting sick by it. And us in the health environment, in the health community, we have to put a connection to these families and recognize that our voices in front of politicians, in front of doctors, in front of administrators have power. And we have to speak truth to power because that's what we do. That's who we are. And we're, we're the ones that are caring for these individuals. So we have to connect what we see, where we drive, with who we're taking care of, and care, and act on that care. That is most important, to act on what we see and what we experience, and that these lives count.
We were given a template. Act on what we've seen and what we've heard. Act on, now we know, now we're all responsible. You should have stayed home and had Netflix, because now you know. <laughs> now we're all guilty, right? Act, and now that we know we, whatever little step we can take. Um, Herman Cena, I know that healthcare and health disparities are something that's very passionate to you, especially within the Haitian community. Would you like to speak towards that, please? Hello, everyone. My name is Herman Cena. Um, as Renee said, my background is in public health and I am a Haitian woman. So the reason why I wanted to go to public health was because of my passion and love for my Haitian community. I feel like one aspect about public health and especially environmental health that we don't talk about is the trauma that comes from what people deal with. I'm pretty sure people have heard of, you know, the, the earthquakes that have ravaged Haiti, but it doesn't have to be that dramatic. I know um, what Haitians are, have gone through is hard and unimaginable, but even from Dawn's story, talking about the dump or just talking about the differences in the roads, that affects our lives and Every environmental health is health in general. Everything about us is touched upon by the environment, what we breathe, what we eat, what, where we interact. Um, so one other aspect of this I said before is to talk about how it affects us mentally, how it keeps us away from access to care, how it affects affects our physical health, therefore affecting our ability to live a happy, joyful, fulfilling, healthy life. So I hope people take that into consideration when we also think about um, public health and environmental justice. We're getting ready to wrap up, but I just wanted to share my story when Herman Cena said it, I remembered that I grew up in Deer Park and back in the 70s and 80s when I grew up, the black people lived in about 13 blocks and then everybody else lived around and we played together when we got to school. We sat separately at lunchtime and we went on different buses. And I remember that there were factories near those 13 blocks. Nobody knew what was in the factories. We just knew the factories were there. You got into mischief by the factories, but we didn't know what was in the factory. My mother's here, so I can't talk much about that. So, <laughs> but I remember that as I got older, I moved away, and then I moved back to Deer Park. And I remember, no, we'll backtrack real quick. Growing up, I remember there was a classmate and her mother had cancer. She had brain cancer. And I remember thinking, wow, she's such a pretty lady. She has a handsome husband. She has these beautiful son and daughter. Good looking people don't get cancer. You know, like, well, well, she has cancer and you have a classmate in like middle school and she died, she lost her mom. Like, that's devastating when you're in middle school when somebody leaves, loses their mom and they live the block away from us. Fast forward, I move away, I come back, I'm now a homeowner, I'm married, I'm growing up, I'm raising my kids in the house I grew up in. And over time, I would hear so many cancer stories within those 13 blocks. We even have Facebook pages where residents of Deer Park talk and we talk about all the people that have died from cancer in those blocks. Another thing I remember thinking about was, I have three classmates. Three classmates that graduated with me in 19, blah, 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 blah. and three of those classmates had their children under 25, which 18 to 25 is technically childbearing years, would you say? And three of those classmates had children with special needs. That's unusual. What 
was next to those 13 blocks. And I remember thinking about it when I had moved back to Deer Park. And I always kept thinking about it and thinking about it. And then I end up moving and I live in Wheatley Heights. And then time passed and then years later, I meet Erica and she mentions environmental justice. And I realized it had always been on my heart. It had always been on my mind. And I believe, especially being a woman of faith, I believe it's on God's mind too because he's into justice and he sees us all equally. We're all equal, regardless of our color, our race, our height, our economics, we're all equal. And I realized that this environmental justice project needs a voice and it needs to continue. Especially because I still have friends on those 13 blocks that are raising their kids, and their kids are raising kids. So now what? So before I conclude, I have a friend that was going to be here. He's 92 years old. He is a leader in the community, but his doctor told him it would be best for him to not come out in public spaces. His name is Mr. Eugene Burnett. He's like my surrogate grandfather. I love him dearly. And so I have him on the phone. And he's going to, I asked him just to give us a little snippet because he has a lot of history and a lot to say. So I asked him to give us a call to action on where he thinks we should go from now. Mr. B, are you there? Yes, I am. All right, Mr. B, we can hear you. Talk to okay. us. We are in the at a very important moment in our journey. And our vote is our voice. Make our voice heard. Vote in every election. Vote every time. Vote everywhere you can. Vote, vote. Remember, if you're one vote for this matter, then why are your adversaries trying so hard to stop you from using it? Our brothers and sisters in South Carolina and Georgia have showed us all just how important and powerful our vote can be. Everyone, stand up and be counted. Register to vote now. Stay connected. Get organized. And love and respect each other for all time. It will lead you to a better day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. B. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. God bless. Have a safe home.